Good evening and welcome to the Institute of Politics. I'm Betty Hung, a senior at the college and a member of the Student Advisory Committee. The Student Advisory Committee is an undergraduate managing board which oversees the student programming of the Institute, organizing such programs as forums, study groups, visits by visiting fellows, and political film series. The Institute of Politics is thus an organization run by and for undergraduates interested in politics and public service. We really encourage everyone interested in becoming involved to attend an introductory meeting this Monday, February 8th from 6 to 8 p.m. in Land Hall, which is right here, located right here in the Kennedy School. Tonight is the first of the Institute's Thursday Night Pizza and Politics series. Every Thursday this semester, the Institute will sponsor a forum discussion on a prominent and often provocative national or international political issue. These dinners and forums like the one tonight are organized completely by undergraduates. We have a distinguished panel of speakers tonight who are here to discuss the future of Asian Americans in politics. With rapidly shifting de demographic changes and an increasing number of Asian American political candidates, the landscape is an exciting and volatile one. Our speakers tonight, one of whom is Patricia Psyche, an institute fellow this semester, will help enlighten and challenge us about the subject. We are also fortunate to have the services of Andrew Leong as our moderator tonight. Mr. Leong is a lecturer at the Law Center of the College of Public and Community Service at the University of Massachusetts in Boston and president of the Asian American Lawyers Association of Massachusetts. He has also been active in community work, serving as a trustee for the Asian American Resource Workshop and the Massachusetts Commission Against Discrimination. Please join me in welcoming our esteemed panel of speakers. Thank you, Betty. Um, as Betty had aptly mentioned, the, the theme for tonight's discussion towards a new diversity, the future of Asian Americans in politics, is in fact quite uh, a timely discussion. Um, not only have demographics changed within the last couple of years, obviously most of us have seen, heard of um, Asian American candidates running for many different types of offices throughout the country. And um, especially relevant for tonight's discussion are all the different presidential appointments um, that's, that's been happening left and right, especially with um, the Clinton administration uh, cl claiming uh, it's going to be an administration made up of um, uh, the diversity that is America. So I'm hoping that later on, uh, during the question and answer session, some of your questions will in fact reflect some of these issues uh, that's happening right now. Our first speaker tonight, uh, Tony Lam, unfortunately is still in the air right now. Um, we're hoping that he'll be able to join us possibly um, at the end of uh, tonight. Uh, hopefully at the reception to follow right after. Uh, but with us uh, is a representative from Tony. Uh, but let me go ahead and um, introduce, give you a little background information about Tony first. Tony, Tony Lamb is the councilman for Westminster City Council in the city of Westminster, California. He is um, a Vietnamese refugee. He came to the United States in the April of 1975, which, which makes uh, you know, the, the fact that he was elected uh, such a very substantial uh, affair. He was, in fact, a volunteer refugee camp manager when they were in Philippines and Guam, and uh, he was a refugee coordinator in Camp Pendleton. And since then, in 1975, he has settled in California. Um, he's been the president of the Vien Dong Restaurants Corporation. He's a trustee of Humana Hospital, uh, goodwill liaison to the Westminster Police Department, commissioner on the Orange County Protocol Commission, a former member of the Westminster Cultural Arts Council, uh, he was a recipient of the award for being the Outstanding Community Leadership, uh, Outstanding Businessman of the Year. So you can see that, you know, this is a quite active person. Uh, and 
Unfortunately, he's not going to be making a formal address, but Tony's representative, uh, Ryan Hubris, is with us uh, and will be reading off the prepared script. Uh, Ryan is the former campaign manager and chief of staff for Tony. He is currently at USC uh, getting, working on his MPA in intergovernmental management. He has worked in the, um, let's see, was it San Francisco City Council? The San Jose, I'm sorry. The LA Board of Supervisors, the California Assembly, and the California Senate. Uh, Ryan is currently doing some work on legislative reform that will affect 13, 11 to 13 public hearings um, over the next two years. So with that, if you would welcome uh, Ryan Hubris, who will be speaking for Tony Lamb tonight. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you, Andrew. Fellow member, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, fellow panel members, ladies and gentlemen, and the members of the Harvard community. It is a great honor and a true personal pleasure to be with you here today. The roles of Asians American in politics involve all of us in this room tonight. And I believe will be increasing, be of increasing importance to the future of this country. As you know, I have the distinction of being the first Vietnamese American ever to be elected to public office of any kind in the United States. I bear this distinction both proudly and humbly. It is a great opportunity for service, but it also carries an immense responsibility to serve well. I want to address the future of Asians American in politics today from the Vietnamese point of view. The current trend in Vietnamese American political participation is sluggish and has been hindered in the past decade due to many factors. I would say that the trend should gradually increase towards the end of the century as we, Vietnamese, overcome the roadblocks that have slowed the entry into the political arena. The presence of the Vietnamese into the mainstream of American politics began in the mid 1970s. After the fall of Saigon, our first priority was to resettle our families and begin our economic recovery. This was very difficult for most Vietnamese and only a handful of us were prosperous in the beginning. The French domination of Vietnam taught us to be instinctively careful and probably overly cautious. In the best of circumstances, I believe we would enter political activities slowly. But remember, it was not easy for us to get into the U.S. in the first place. Almost all Vietnamese that came to the U.S. went through many dangers and hardship. This was very difficult, but as people, we would prevail. Once established in the towns and cities in the United States that we would call home, our focus narrowed. There is a great division between the Vietnamese people, and I believe that as we evolve into the American way of doing things, this division will gradually improve. As an example, in Westminster, California, a majority of Vietnamese have settled in an area known as Little Saigon. There are 27 separate newspaper and magazines to serve the 100,000 or so Vietnamese that live in the surrounding cities. This points out the first major problem. There is no united front. Several Vietnamese political organizations were established in the past decade, however, they, gave not, they have not come to the forefront of the community at large and have no political power. There exists an attitude of isolation for a community agenda and the constant infighting between the established power groups create an atmosphere that will continue our fragmentation as a group. Our power will come only when we become a united community. I believe this will happen through our children and I will encourage them to become more involved into community and political service. As for Tony Lamb, reading on his behalf, I did not intend to become a politician 
when I arrived in the U.S. in 1975. It was not my plan or course of action to develop a broad community base of support through vast community activity. I just did it because I am a person who wants to help and make a difference. The list of community involvement, civic programs, and charitable endeavors I have engaged in during the past 18 years are too numerous to mention. I spent most of my waking hours on volunteer community work, giving assistance to other Vietnamese, particularly con the continuing flow of new arrivals. Helping my fellow countrymen adjust to the new country obviously brought me in contact with many Americans, including many in government and elected office. I made many new friends and acquaintances and began to learn how the American governmental and political system function. It was never my desire to become an elected official, but I could see a great need for a Vietnamese to serve as a contact point or a person who could bring the specific needs and concern of the Vietnamese people of Westminster to City Hall. It was in that context that I ran for City Council. The broad base of support and the foundation that I created during my years of civic and community service was the vehicle that propelled me during my City Council race in 1992. I was very lucky to have attracted several old pearls who helped guide my campaign. We were able to overcome insurmountable odds. My volunteer staff worked thousands of hours doing all the grassroots things necessary to win. In fact, on the Thursday before the election day, it was raining very hard, and as I was not, and I was not going to walk precincts that were on the schedule for the day. One of these old pros said to me, Come on, Tony, let's go pre walk precincts. I told him, no, it's raining too hard. He looked at me and said, Tony, we're going out and getting some votes. Let's go to the precinct that we are do not doing well in and talk to the people. Then he said, this is going to be great. Just like the 1960s, when I walked for John Kennedy, the people will love you for walking in this rain. I want to tell you, I did it walk in the rain with this volunteer for five hours. I talked to many wonderful people that day, and maybe that day put us over the top. During my campaign, I reached out to all citizens of Westminster, not just Vietnamese. Essentially, my supporters and I had to campaign on two fronts. One, the Vietnamese. One, the other non-Vietnamese. In the Vietnamese community, we faced great skepticism. Almost everyone just felt there was no chance for a Vietnamese, so why bother? Not surprising, most of the Vietnamese who had become U.S. citizens were still regist not registered to vote. Of the some 18,000 Vietnamese in Westminster, only about 1,900 were registered when my campaign started. In fact, many experts predicted that the first generation of Vietnamese in America would never make it to the mainstream political arena, especially in elected public office that would have to wait for more Americanized future generations. Well, the first thing my campaign did was to launch an intensive registration drive among the Vietnamese in Westminster. This effort was not just to register more potentially favorable favorable voters, but also to educate the Vietnamese citizens about their responsibilities as citizens and the importance of participating in the American free election process. After a lot of hard work, we added over 22 new registered Vietnamese to a total of about 4,100 who were eligible to vote last November. Happily, most of them did exercise their full rights as American citizens and did actually vote. Gratefully, I was elected with the support of the entire city. The vote count bears this out. I received only 39% of the vote from the Asian community and 61 came from the non-Vietnamese groups. It was a long and hard fought race and the winning margin was only by 132 vote. 
there were, men, there were more than 26,000 votes, voters that went through the polls today. And I hear that Tony is here. And so he's going to be completing the last portion of this. Wait, what you can talk about now? Okay. Which paragraph are we on? Just what can talk about? Hate or not? Can hate Oh, really? Yeah. It's really been a hectic night for me. Thanks, Ryan, to cover me, as you've been always doing that. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I'd, uh, well, let me read the, 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 the last portion of my uh, speech. Uh, this seems to be very strange to you, isn't it? <laughs> when I look back at that campaign, I often wonder how many voters decided to vote for me on that rainy Thursday afternoon. What do I, Tony Lamb, envision or hope for the future of Asian American in politics? Well, as I look out at this group of people here in this forum, I see the brightest of the bright from our community. I see young men and women who ascended to, very, to the very pinnacle of education in the United St States of America, Harvard University. I hope that some of you will take this education back to your community and begin the long journey of public and community service so that you too can develop that broad base and foundation so that you can be a position to make a difference for yourself and your children Get involved, be part of the whole community, transcend the isolation of one day, take your place as the leader of this great country. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tony and Ryan. I, I have to mention that Ryan is also a Vietnamese American and is, is only 23 years old, even though he was uh, reading most of uh, the speech today. I'm sure that one of these days he'll probably come back and read his own speech. <coughs> Our next speaker for tonight is Gloria Mahino Ochoa. Um, Gloria attended the University of California, Davis, where she graduated with a degree in chemistry. She worked as a uh, staff research chemist, specializing in the effects of toxic and environmental pollutants. And then later, she attended and graduated from the UC Davis School of Law. And she began the practice of law um, in 1976, I'm sorry. Um, Gloria's career in public services included uh, the counsel to the California Senate Judiciary Committee, Assistant Secretary for Housing in the California Business, Transportation, and Housing Agency, Public Advisor to the California Energy Resources, Conservation and Development Commission, and she was a member of the California State Board of Dental Examiners. Gloria was elected to the Board of Supervisors of Santa Barbara County in June of 1988. As the first district supervisor, she has represented the city of uh, Carpentaria. I think I killed the name of that. It's all right. What, what, what was that? Carpentaria. Carpentaria, okay. And the communities of Summerlin, Montecito, and portions of the city of Santa Barbara. Since her election, 
Gloria has served on the Joint Legislative Committee on the Changing Family, the State Affordable Housing Task Force, and the CSUS Statewide Growth Management Task Force. She is currently the chair of the Housing, Land Use, and Transportation Committee of, this, of the California State Association of Counties and a member of the Board of Directors of the Local Government Commission. Um, Gloria has also been quite active in the community in the past. Uh, she has received um, numerous awards, as I, as, as I can see here, which you know, we'll probably take the rest of tonight to read off of, um, but many different public service awards, uh, including one from the Asian Pacific American Legal Center of Los Angeles, which you know, when you, whenever you talk about legal services, is always dear to my heart. So um, let us all welcome Gloria Mahino Ochoa. Actually, what um, Andrew Leon forgot to mention as uh, my most recent qualification to stand here before you and talk about Asian Americans in politics today is the fact that I ran for Congress uh, in 1992. I was the Democratic nominee for the 22nd Congressional District in California, and that is in Santa Barbara and San Luis Obispo County. I was, um, I was one of the three Asians running in California for Congress uh, for the November election. Unfortunately, only one of us won, and I'll tell you a little bit about that campaign in a minute. But I wanted to um, welcome Tony Lam. That was a grand entrance, if I ever saw one. And I think it's a great campaign trick, you see, to send your campaign manager first to speak and get everybody all riled up and then come in and make the grand entrance. So that was great. I'll remember it in my next campaign. Um, we're here to talk about Asian American in politics and the future of Asian Americans in politics in the United States. And I'm really glad to see so many of you out here to, to uh, talk about this because it is an issue that is very, very hot right now in Washington, D.C. If you are, have been reading the newspapers, you will uh, remember that President Clinton made a commitment to make his cabinet look as diverse as America is. You will remember that he has appointed many women. He has appointed many African, uh, some African Americans to his cabinet. He has appointed Latinos to his cabinet. He has yet to appoint an Asian American to the cabinet. And this has caused a lot of consternation in the uh, realm of those Asian Americans who are uh, in Congress, uh, who are aspiring to be in Congress, who are leaders in their own right, in their own parties, in the different states. I believe that President Clinton will make uh, that promise good. The problem is that Asian Americans have not been in politics too long in this country, and that somehow those who have been in that class of uh, political representatives have gone on to be, uh, wanted to stay on, such as Congressman Norm Mineta, who wanted to stay on as, as uh, transportation um, committee chair in Congress, and Congressman Bob Matsui, who wants to stay on as the chairman of the Ways and Means Co Subcommittee in the Appropriations Committee in Congress. And so the rest of us, and, and Pat, of course, uh, Pat Syke is, of course, a fellow here at Harvard, and Patsy Mink is still in Congress. And so there is what, what the point is that I want to make is that there are not that many of us out there that have had the experience and the quality of experience that somehow is necessary in order to make it to the top levels of government. But that doesn't mean that there is no future for us. I want to take um, a moment here and talk a little bit about Filipinos in Asian American politics and Filipinos in politics in America. Unlike um, the Vietnamese American community that Tony represents, the Filipinos have been here in this country for 240 years. And so when I decided to run for office, first in um, 1988, I had to look back and see what kind of support I can get from the Filipino community, what kind of support can I get from the Asian American community. 
in order to succeed in this elective office. You heard some of the work that I had done. I was a chemist, I was an attorney. I done all these things in appointed office in the state. And I wanted to, to cross that line and become an elected official. At that point in time, there actually was on, had only been one Filipino who, had been, uh, who, who ran for the state assembly, and he did not succeed. He was a supervisor in one of the counties in California. There were only a smattering of council members and mayors all across the country. And there were only a smattering of judges. I think there are actually only two judges in California or Filipino-American descent, and one of them sitting right here, Judge Mel Redricana from Los Angeles. And so it was a, a very um, a sobering thing to realize that there are not that many of us out there to mentor those who are coming up the ranks. Um, and so it was um, very important for me to remember that Filipinos had been here for a long time, they had not been represented, and so it was sort of a mission of mine to make sure that when I got into elected politics that I brought with me my community and that I make sure that there are other Filipino Americans out there, that there are other Asian Americans out there who can follow the footsteps that I will have to take in order to get into elected politics. I happened to have chosen a district that was not Asian American, uh, that was not uh, ethnic as a majority of the voters. The district that I ran in in Santa Barbara County was 65% um, Anglo, 25% to 28% Latino, 1.5% Asians, and 1% black, and the rest were others. So I could not depend on the Asian American community, basically, to get me over. And what I had to depend upon is my ability as a, a citizen of the world, as a citizen, just a plain citizen, who's able to reach out to the different communities and talk about issues that were common issues that were important to the people, issues that were important to me as a Filipino, issues that were important to me as an Asian, issues that were important to me as a mother, issues that were important to me as a woman, and sell myself on those issues. And I talk about this because I think that the future of Asian Americans in politics in America will rest, not just in our ability to unite ourselves as diverse a group as we are, into being Asian Americans, to being identified as an Asian American community in a cohesive fashion with a single goal in mind to politically empower ourselves, but also as a group that is able to reach out and join hands with other communities, with other ethnic communities, with other interest groups out there in order to promote the betterment of the quality of life for all of us. That's what made me into a very strong congressional candidate in the same kind of a district. Um, I want to digress a little bit and talk about um, demographic patterns. We are a fast-growing group in America. We are probably you know, the next sleeping giant in American politics because we are fast-growing in numbers. We are growing tremendously economically, and we are, as a class, higher educated, and we are, as a class, I think, able to transcend some of those barriers at the local levels so that we can start learning how to become leaders at the national level by becoming appointed to boards and commissions at the local level, move on to council, move on to county boards of supervisors, move on to become judges, and so on and so forth. But we need to focus. We need to focus on, first of all, being able to get beyond our own diversity as Asian Americans. We need to be able to encourage all of our new immigrants to go ahead and become citizens, because you will find, if you look at the statistics, that 80% of those immigrants who have been here 15 years or longer become citizens and vote, and they vote consistently. You will find that 50, 
3% or so of those immigrants who had been here, um, say, 7 to 12 years, will become citizens and will vote consistently. But only about 30% of those who had been here less than seven years actually become citizens and vote, and vote consistently. And so as more immigrants come in, as they are here longer, as they become more and more a part of the community in their own right, they will become citizens, they will register, and they will vote. But it's incumbent upon those of us who are, quote unquote, the leaders in the community and that means all of you, because when you go back to your communities, you will be leaders. There's just no question about that. You are, you are going to go back out there and become successful professionals and become leaders, and you will bring with you these philosophies. You will bring with you these ideas that you must go back to the community and get the community to politically empower itself by becoming citizens, by registering, and by voting. Let me talk a little bit about my campaign because I think that it's a, it's a very interesting campaign. I ran in a district that was, as I said, 65% Anglo, 25, 28% Latino, 1.5% Asian, 1% African Americans, and the rest others. Um, it was a valiant campaign, according to everybody in Washington anyway. I'm notorious now for being the one congressional candidate who lost to the guy who spent $6 million to win the race. $6 million is a pretty big number. You know, it is the most money ever spent in a congressional race in the history of the United States. I was outspent 12 to 1. <laughs> but despite that fact, I raised and spent more money than the average congressional candidate in the country. Most of that money I raised from little people. I raised from Asian Americans, from Latinos, from African Americans, from women. Most of that money I raised not in the big contributor way, like some people, some, some Asian Americans have learned to give to the parties of their choice. They've learned to give large sums of money to candidates of their choice. But as a group, the Asian American community, I think, and the Filipino community in particular, need to learn that in order to support the people that they want to have in office, they must take some money out of their pocket and give. Because after all, that's what politics is all about. You know, When you go out there and you, and you, and you try to be elected, there are two things that are very important. You either have the votes or you have the money in order to reach the voters. And so when you are a community trying to exercise your political clout, you want to make sure that the candidates know that you have the votes or you have the money. That's something that we have to learn as a group, that we are very strong economically, that we can support candidates and issues, not just with our votes, but also with our economic power. As a sleeping giant, I think we really are much bigger than what they uh, have said us to be. The future of Asian Americans in politics rests in your hands. Running for office is a very difficult thing to do. It requires a tremendous amount of sacrifice, and I will guarantee you the story that was told today by Tony about going out there and walking in the rain for five hours is just one little vignette. The campaign is a whole series of vignettes just like that, of staying up 20, 22 hours a day, driving long distances, missing out on your dinner and your lunch and your breakfast, and then stuffing yourself with rubber chickens night after night after night for a week in a row, not being able to see your children, losing the time to practice your profession, and I've had to do that. I had to give up my law practice in order to stay in office and run for another office. It's, it, it's a tremendous sacrifice, but it is worth it if you have the goal in mind of making sure that your community, whether it be the general community at large, whether it be the Asian community because of the special issues that are important to the Asian community, or the ethnic community because of issues of social justice and equal opportunity and all of that, if you have a goal in mind, 
then it's worth the sacrifice. And it may not happen very soon, but it will happen later to some of you, that you develop the networking that you need to develop with the different communities and the different interest groups so that you are actually hooked into a very broad base of support before you run for office. Some of you will probably go into your professions and then go run later, which is what I did. But at the same time, it's very important to remember that there is a community out there that just needs to be nurtured, and that's us. The Asian Americans in this country are waking up. They're going to start flexing their muscle. It's going to take a lot of leaders, because there are only very few of us out there right now, out in the forefront. There's Tony for the Vietnamese community. There's myself and, and Judge Rakana for the Filipino community and a couple of others. And there's Pat Psyche and Pat's and uh, um, Michael Wu for the Chinese American community, uh, Pat Psyche for the, for the Japanese American community. There are very, very few of us. And really, it will take more, like yourselves, to be involved, and this is great, because this is a learning process. And hopefully, before the night is over, we'll be able to exchange more ideas, we'll be able to help you, and you will be able to help us understand what are the problems that we have in terms of communicating with the young Asian Americans that we have in this country. I think, uh, you know, just one last vignette before I close. Last night, I was at a, um, um, a dinner in Los Angeles honoring one of the um, uh, more honored writers of Filipino descent, P.C. Morante. He was lecturing at UCLA, and one of the guests was a woman who was trying to put together a Filipino-American studies course at UCLA. And she talked about this groundswell of support by Filipino-American students who had this need to know more about what went on in the Filipino-American community from day one when the Filipinos first got to Louisiana through Mexico, and what happened with Filipinos in the realm of culture and art and music and politics over all these years. The same thing is going on in every other Asian American community. The young people are yearning to learn more about their community because they want to know what role they can play in the future and how they can play it out. And those of us that are out there now, running for office, speaking out at forums like this, have the obligation to tell it like it is. It's not going to be easy, but it can be done. Thank you. I think one of the things that you learned tonight, just, just from looking at the composition of the panel, was, um, is that you cannot label us. Because although there's the generic Asian American, we are ethnically Japanese, Filipino, Vietnamese, Chinese, you know, what have you. And we are we are immigrant, we are refugee, we are, you know, fourth, fifth generation, we are Democrat, we are Republican. You can't pigeonhole us. Um, our first two speakers are, in fact, immigrants. Our next speaker um, from, from Hawaii, Pat Psyche, who is also a, a fellow here at the Kennedy School for this semester, so make sure that you guys take advantage of her while she's here. Um, was the head administrator of the Small Business Administration in 1991 to 1993. She was a member of the United States House of Representatives from 1987 to 1991, and she was also in 1990 the Republican nominee for U.S. Senate in, in, in Hawaii. Masaki served as the chair of the Republican Party of Hawaii from 1983 to 1985, and from 1974 to 1982, um, Pat was the state senator in, Hawaii, in, the, in the Hawaii state legislature and served as the state rep from 1968 to 1974. 
Uh, Ms. Saike was also chair of the National Women's Business Council from 1991 to 1992 and was the federal liaison to Rebuild LA. She served on the President's Advisory Council on the status of women from 1969 to 1977 and last year was named Asian American of the Year by the Asia Pacific Council. Ms. Saike is also the author of the Equal Rights Amendment um, in the Hawaii State uh, Constitution. So you can see that um, we have pretty much a, a veteran here. So uh, with that, please welcome Pat Saiki. Thank you very much and aloha. Aloha. You don't know what to do. <laughs> you haven't been to Hawaii? We haven't trained you right. Aloha. 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 That's it, that's it. I have to always plug my state because I know that you're all going to be visiting it one of these days and bring all your money. <laughs> we need it in Hawaii. I thought that introduction was going to really start to age me, you know, <laughs> uh, as you went back uh, through my many years of uh, ex experience. And I must say that I have truly gained an awful lot through politics, because it is politics that makes our country hum. It is politics that decides what is the future of the world. And to participate in it is truly a gift because it is the people who are your constituents who elect you and allow you to serve. And so you are truly a public servant. And I have cherished that and respected it for all of the years that I have been involved. As an Asian American, of course, I'm very proud to have a rich heritage that allows me to perhaps see things in different perspectives. But then you Irish people do the same thing. And uh, the blacks do the same thing. Where is Lee Daniels? Is he still here? Is he's, where are you? Is, is he up there now? Okay, let's, hear, let's see a wave. He's a fellow institute fellow. <laughs> and he's going to have a very provocative study group, so I want you all to go and take advantage. Uh, of Lee's expertise. But I'd like to share a few facts with you. Asian Americans number approximately 7.3 million people in the United States of America, which is about 3% of the total population of the United States. But Asian Americans own more than 4% of all United States businesses. In fact, between 1982 and 87, the number of Asian-owned firms in America increased 89% to a total of 355,000 businesses. The number of workers these firms employed more than doubled during this period, and the annual receipts of these businesses skyrocketed an incredible 161% to total 33 billion dollars, making Asian American owned businesses the fastest growing sector in all of the United States. Now besides all of this then, Asian Americans have historically enjoyed a much higher level of success than other racial and ethnic minority groups, so say the minority business magazines. They continue to say that more than other minorities, Asian owners have developed strong support networks. We call it social capital, which provide both formal and informal support through such functions as positive role modeling, training, and experience. High education levels and business experience are another reason for Asian American business growth rates. So, Harvard students, community interested people who are here tonight, why then aren't Asian Americans on the Clinton cabinet? 
Now, I'm going to respectfully, because she's a good friend of mine, after tonight, she's a great friend, Gloria, I'm going to respectfully disagree with Gloria that you have to have, an ex we have such a small pool of experienced people that Mr. Clinton could not appoint an Asian American to the cabinet. Well, he's done very well, and I commend him for the diversity that he has brought forth in his cabinet. I do commend him for that. And there are an unusual number of blacks, as well as Hispanics, as well as women, but no Asian American. And to say that because the pool of experienced people is so limited that he couldn't make that appointment is, to me, the same excuse we used for many years against the blacks. And so I say that I hope that heretofore, the president will give consideration to naming people like Gloria. She's experienced. She's very qualified. You don't have to take a member of Congress. I served there for two terms. <laughs> you don't necessarily have to take a member of Congress and elevate that person to the cabinet. You've got a lot of marvelous, talented people out there in the community who can serve just as well. And I ask you, with all of these great successes that Asian Americans are supposed to have, as far as bi the business world is concerned and social and educational development, why is it that some major universities keep attempting to set quotas for the restriction of Asian American enrollments? Of course, I leave out Harvard. I've already talked to the dean. <laughs> we had lunch together. Yes, we did. <laughs> and with all of these successes, do US immigration laws treat Asians fairly? There are many who disagree. Why? Why did it take 50 long years for loyal Japanese Americans to receive reparations for being placed in World War II internment camps against their will? Why does Japan bashing that goes on everywhere go unchallenged? Why was there no loud outcry from the press or from politicians when Korean merchants were victims of the Los Angeles riots? Did we have a full Justice Department investigation when the civil rights of these Asian Americans were violated during these riots? The answer is no. And where were the members of Congress when these same Korean merchants were mandated by law to rebuild in the same business area which was destroyed? Now, I am more intimately involved in this than most, because I was asked by President Bush to be the point person, to be first to arrive from the administration in Los Angeles at the time of the riots, because small businesses were involved. And of course, I'm the head of the US Small Business Administration. Worked very closely with Mayor Bradley and with Governor Pete Wilson, viewed the damage, saw <coughs> the kind of devastation that occurred, and not just among the buildings and the uh, material things. It's an emotional kind of hurt that occurred in those Korean merchants. And then we at the SBA have a very effective, what we call, disaster assistance program. Never before was the SBA directed by law to force people who needed loans to rebuild in the same area. Why did this occur? They're Korean. They did not speak up. All of these injustices go on today. And I'm not saying that, that we should rise up. Maybe we, we should. <laughs> Don't you think it's a great idea? 
But we have to examine why these things occur. And let's not blame it all on the government or blame it on any one entity. Let's take a good look and see what's been happening with us as Asian Americans. We have our nice groups, don't we? We have the Chinese American Chamber of Commerce and the Japanese American Citizens League and the Korean Merchants Association. And we've got the Filipino Chamber of Commerce. And we've got all of these diverse groups. And each of us meets individually because we're bound together culturally and educationally. And I think that's honorable. I think that's marvelous because we are each sharing with each other what we want to retain of what is our heritage. But the very fact that we are so fractured doesn't allow us to speak with one voice. I think the blacks have done a much better job of being able to coalesce and form coalitions and be heard as a voice. And I think Jesse Jackson has been very effective as one of the voices from the black community. But we as Asians have not done that. The very essence of our attempt to retain our cultural heritage by forming our own groups has kept us from joining together. Or maybe we haven't really thought about it. Maybe that's what we have to do in order that we can be heard. Then let's look at public perceptions. What are the public perceptions of Asians? It was very interesting. I was watching a, a public, stir, public broadcasting program the other evening. And uh, the fact was presented that TV programs hereafter have to have appeal to the black community because it is a fact that the average black family watches TV 70 hours per week. Everyone else will range between 40 and, 50 per, for, uh, 40 and 50 hours a week. And so if you're going to design a sitcom and you want to be up on the Nielsen ratings, you've got to be able to draw in the biggest audience, which is the black community. Where does that put us Asians? You know, it just is not the kind of, of uh, image that is being properly created of, a of Asians on TV that gets us to be acceptable to the rest of the community. It is well known by the people who discussed all of this, television producers, that said that we have great difficulty in trying to move Asians into the ordinary sitcom or some kind of TV programming because people expect that they're either going to be houseboys or the Yakuza. You know, they're either mobsters or criminals or, uh, and this is their, this is the image. And this lends to people looking at Asians as foreigners. And as long as the TV image of Asians are cast in the eyes, uh, are cast to people as being foreigners, then it's going to be even more difficult to break through the barrier of acceptance in the TV community. Now we have exceptions, don't we? Connie Chung is great. <laughs> Linda Tyra is terrific. She's from Hawaii, too. <laughs> Ken Koshiwahara, who also did his original broadcasting in Hawaii, I mean, these are fantastic newscasters, and they're up front, and they're doing their thing. And I think they are helping to break down the uh, misinterpretation of what an Asian really is. And then let's look at ourselves. Let's take a good look at ourselves. As Asians, uh, we are known by everyone else to be very thoughtful. I like to put it that way. We don't do well on the SAT scores when it comes to uh, being able to vocalize, to be able to express ourselves. This is historic. Why? Because we bring up our children to be seen and not heard. And there is a reticence on the part of Asians to, be, to, to speak up, to take an aggressive role in expressing themselves. Of course, you don't see us shy up here. But I think there needs to be this encouragement among our young people, you people at Harvard. You can be the ones to break through that barrier 
of verbal expression because you not only have the educational qualifications, but you also have the motivation to be successful. And in order to do that, we have to be able to verbalize. So I think in many ways, Asians do it to themselves. We can, people can afford to ignore us. They can afford to put us in the back room. They can afford not to give us a seat at the table because we don't grumble. We don't squawk about it. We seem to feel that tomorrow will be our day. Well, don't you think it's time that we stepped up and said, tomorrow is today, and that we should speak up today for ourselves, that we should work together, because I think Asian Americans have so much to contribute to this great country of ours. And I am not approaching this from a racial, ethnic point of view. I am approaching this from a total point of view that just because you happen to be Asian Americans doesn't mean that your opinions should be ignored. So I say to all of you, I'm gonna be here for a whole semester. Anytime that you start getting lazy and sitting back on your okole, <laughs> that's Hawaiian for you know what, stop by and see me and I will give you a little shot of adrenaline. Thank you. Before we start the, the question and answer session, I just want to make sure that people know that you know the microphones are over there. So if you have questions, you, you want to make sure to start lining up at this point in time. Um, Pat, I I have to say that uh, it's not too often, but you know I have to say I agree with this Republican's comments tonight. <laughs> um, to be to be fair on the record. I do want to reiterate Gloria's point that you know, a, a position was informally offered to Representative Norman Mineta for Secretary of Transportation. You know, he um, did not take up on that particular offer. So uh, as such, we don't have any Asian Americans on the cabinet level. However, on the sub-cabinet level as of today, we have um, two Asian Americans. Um, Doris Matsui, who is the wife of uh, Congressman Bob Matsui, is in fact the deputy assistant to the president for public liaison. And then Shirley Sagawa is the special assistant to the president for domestic policy. So um, with that on the record, um, questions? Um, Gloria, in your opening comments, you alluded to the one Asian who won a seat in Congress. And I'd like to ask you, um, what were the key elements that uh, gave Jay Kim his victory? Money. <clears throat> well, um, I believe that that had a lot to do with it, um, obviously. Also, he ran in a Republican district. And he, you know, being a Republican and there not having been a very strong, I guess, Democrat challenge there, he, he made it. And I think it's great because the more Asian Americans in a invisible positions, the better. Um, <clears throat> I, I talked a little bit about my campaign because um, I wanted to get into the financing, campaign financing as a real uh, challenge to Asian Americans who are thinking of running for office. It's a, because of the number of businesses, Asian American businesses that are in this country, you would think and the number of Asian American people in this country already, you would think that if every Asian American gave a dollar to a big PAC, for example, that <clears throat> gave only to Asian American candidates or supported Asian American issues, with 7.3 million Asian Americans giving a dollar, you'd have 7.3 million dollars, right? That's easy. Well, the truth of the matter is that there are probably <clears throat> a handful, maybe you know, a couple of handfuls of Asian Americans who give large sums of money to, one, to um, either party, and maybe another couple of handfuls who are large contributors to individuals, you know, uh, to support the candidates or issues. But not that many Asian Americans really give in small amounts consistently to support candidates and issues. And it's something that we need to teach our community. 
The Filipino community, for example, is one community that I reached out to very strongly in my campaign because I'm from the Philippines. And again, here we go again. Here are the, there's the regionalism. I mean, the, the, ethni the ethnicity is breaking down you know, within the Asian American community and, and each one of us going first into our community and going to the larger Asian American community. Um, it, it was a very difficult thing to reach out to each and every Filipino American to give to the campaign. People don't seem to understand that there is a connection somehow between <clears throat> their support of, of, of uh, uh, elections, of, of politicians, of candidates, and what they get back in terms of the quality of the legislation that gets passed or the issues that the political leaders deal with. And somehow that needs to be translated. For example, the hardest people to reach were the professionals, the doctors, and even the lawyers. You know, and I'm an attorney. They were hard to reach <clears throat> because somehow they felt that if they practice their profession, they are they 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 are they are very competent in their profession. They don't think that politics has anything to do with what they do professionally, and yet they realize afterwards that somehow the legislation that gets passed in the healthcare system, for example, affects their practice. But they were hard to reach. I, that's one thing we need to really develop is the financing of our candidates and issues. Okay, if you don't mind me following up on the money point, you say that's how Jay Kim won. Um, he didn't come from an Asian American district. Um, right. How did he get the money to break out of the Republican primary pack? Well, you don't need to just collect money from your district, you know. Um, for example, again, I will use my campaign because I'm very familiar with the way I tried to raise money. I went all over the country reaching out to Asian Americans and Filipino communities because I knew that if I just tried to raise money within my own district, which was only you know, one and a half percent Asian, I, I couldn't raise enough money to run the campaign. So I had to reach out to the, to the rest of the Asian American community all over. And what happened there is that as you do that, you spend less time in your district campaigning. And so we need to teach our Asian American communities to give to their candidates so that the candidates, the Asian American candidates who are running can run in the district and not have to travel all over the country running a national campaign for a district election. Beyond that particular lesson, I think you know, some of you know this already. You know, statistically, insofar as ethnic groups are concerned, Asian Americans are the, be, be, behind the Jewish group. Asian Americans are the highest insofar as national giving to political campaigns, okay? But, but the lesson that we also need to tell our people is that, you know, don't just give the money. Demand something back for those dollars. You know, what, what, do, we, what do we get out of it? You know, we'll get a little, nice little picture with Clinton here or, you know, with Bush or so forth and so on. But we don't, you know, I guess it's still that Asian mentality in us. We don't want to demand, we don't want to ask for something in return for those dollars. Hi, I have a question to all three of the panelists about the concept of Asian American. And I'm originally from Sri Lanka. And I was wondering, first of all, whether how inclusive you think that label is, Asian American, whether it includes people from the subcontinent, India, Bangladesh, Pakistan, Sri Lanka. And the second question, that I think you're right. I think a lot of people really feel and tie much more so to their own nation, national identity group than Asian American. You all mentioned it. But what specifically can we do to try and bring that those groups together and coalesce them into an Asian American group. Go ahead, Tony. Go ahead, Tony. Go ahead. After you. After me. You came in. No. After you, lady. <laughs> well, let me talk from the perspective of California. We try to be all inclusive, obviously, in California about what an Asian American is. We are Asian American, uh, our Asian Pacific American, Pacific Islander. Democratic Caucus includes everybody. You know, we, we have the nationalities that you mentioned. And I think that to transcend the ethnic boundaries of each of those communities for a common goal is really what's going to unite us. And that is, you know, there are, there, the numbers really aren't there for each of those ethnic groups to be able to exercise political muscle, whether it be by votes or by contributions. And so the more united we are in terms of uh, our goal of 
you know, promoting Asian American interests you know, throughout the political system, um, the easier it will be. And I think just the need to be together, to bind together for numbers is important. If I can just add a comment to that, uh, where is that gentleman? He's I'll take there. you any day, in as an Asian, <laughs> as I would take anyone else who may be Asian at heart. <laughs> I see a lot of blonde-haired, blue-eyed people here. You may be Asian at heart. You believe that this country of ours, this great country of ours, has to include everyone. And the voices have to be heard. And whether the voices are Chinese, Japanese, Armenian, Jewish, Irish, or Scotch, Scots, right? Scotch is another thing. <laughs> <laughs> it's getting late. <laughs> I, th I think that uh, I think you're looking at a probably a smaller definition of the word Asian, but I agree with uh, Gloria in that we have to be all inclusive, so that I would say all Asians or Asians at heart who feel that it's important for minority groups to be heard, uh, they're welcome. Tony, I believe uh, that it's only if we can have a chance to exchange view and do things together, no matter where you are, no matter how far you live, India, Sri Lanka, you know, in Singapore or where else in Asia, uh, we all under the same roof. We feel that as long as you are not a selfish one. You care for other people. And we work on the same goal like uh, Pat mentioned. I, I think that uh, there's a lot in common to do. Uh, before I come here, I was invited, uh, I'm invited uh, by another uh, organization they call Japanese American Citizen League of uh, in uh, Los Angeles. As a matter of fact, the headquarters in San Francisco, they invite us to invite me to be part of the panel to talk about the concern of the Asian unity and Asian in politics. And I feel that it's, it's uh, really a step forward because we have to discuss common ground, what we can do. Last week, also a Korean councilman of Garden Grove discussed the matters of his concern. And my point is that let's get together, discuss this, and in order to tackle the matter of the crime fighting, that we want to do something uh, positively instead of negatively. Uh, before we go on, I'm sorry, I didn't introduce uh, uh, you gentlemen and lady, that's my wife, and thanks to her, uh, she's always by my side. So it's, uh, <clears throat> she's the uh, mother of six children, three girls and three boys, and we have two grandchildren, and uh, She's uh, an educator back home, and uh, that's why my, I'm very proud that my children has graduated, three of them, older one. The oldest graduate at the age of 19 with magna cum laude from UCI as an electrical engineer, and she uh, also employee of the year for Rockwell International in uh, California. So I'm very proud about the education of my children. Tony, I'm sorry. The rest of your family me. running for office here? <laughs> Good evening. I'm a second year master's in public administration student here, and I have a question. I'd just like to also make a comment uh, about the school. I'm very happy and very proud to be a student here, but unfortunately, one of the things I'm not too proud of is the, the record that the school has on the faculty or the, the lack of record in hiring. Uh, 
to my knowledge. So they've done, they've done a very poor job, uh, especially what, with people of color and Asian Americans. To their credit, they are now, they just announced today that they're looking for tenured and non-tenured positions. So as you go back to your parts of the world, you know, take that message with you and I'm sure they'll be open to, to input. Uh, my question is a um, two-part uh, two question, please. One, to the former congresswoman who I uh, found myself in agreement with, I'm on the other side of the aisle, as they say, but when you were talking about uh, the point that Ms. Ochoa made about uh, Clinton appointing someone to the cabinet, I, I agree with you, but, and I don't mean this out of disrespect, but what happened to the 12 years previous to that? And I'm not asking out of partisanship, but out of interest. What, I'd like to know what happened there. And uh, the, other, the other question is, as someone who was born in Cuba and also wonders about Cuban American, when Pat Buchanan was speaking at the Republican convention, he made a point that uh, I took very serious and, and keep in my mind and think about all the time, mostly because I don't have an answer. And he said that they should not be a hyphenated American. And I wonder how, you know, that's, that's an open question. I just wanted to hear from the Asian American side. What was the view on that? Uh, first of all, we had the dean to lunch. We did discuss the uh, seriousness of the situation. We have no tenured Asian American hyphenated uh, <coughs> professor. Uh, we also expressed our concern that there is no tenured female in the Kennedy School of Government. Uh, Lynn Martin, who is here also as an institute fellow, was the Secretary of Labor. Uh, she and I and Lee Daniels and a whole bunch of us had lunch with the dean and expressed our concern. Lee Daniels, of course, is black. Uh, and we are a diverse group, and so we expressed our concern. We were assured that the concerns were well taken. Of course, we leave after a semester, you know, so uh, you all have to sort of keep those fires burning. Uh, I think it's more a matter of um, understanding uh, and acceptance that there needs to be change, and then there will be change. Uh, as far as the uh, Clinton administration is concerned, uh, he is the one that brought up the need for diversity. That doesn't mean that there wasn't a need for diversity for 12 years. I am saying, however, that it was not addressed. It is being addressed today. So now is the chance, now is the time. The climate is right. And I say that we then, as Asian Americans, mobilize and see what we can do to speak up. I served as one of the highest ranking uh, members of the Bush administration. I was at a sub-cabinet level. I was the administrator of the U.S. Small Business Administration. It was considered one of the more uh, higher ranking uh, administration positions. And I enjoyed it very much. As far as Pat Buchanan is concerned, he has his opinions, I have mine. I mean, you know, <laughs> uh, if we're gonna use a hyphenation, uh, hy hyphen, it's getting late. Um, Asian American, Chinese American, I think it's more because we like to define ourselves ethnically because we take great pride in it. Asian American, uh, I think there will be a day when uh, there will be no need for it. But for now, as we are emerging as a group, I believe the hyphen is helpful. We assure everyone that we are not foreigners. We're American. Okay, over here. I heard that Asian American voters are fairly split in terms of their voting patterns, about half for the Republican Party and half for the Demo Democratic Party, unlike the African American community and the Latino American community. Do you see it as being, um, how easy do you think it is for Asian American candidates to transcend the, the party differences and for the Asian American community to rally behind that candidate, whether that candidate is from the opposite party? And how does that impact on where Asian Americans should run for office? Should they run for in a district where there's a lot of Asians but you know, happen to be people of the opposite party or run in a district where there's people in their own party? Go ahead, Gloria. <laughs> well, um, I think it's very healthy, for one thing, to have such a diversity in terms of party affiliation in the Asian American community. I do think, however, that as people um, have broader experiences in American society and um, 
there will be some maybe changes in the pattern. For example, in Los Angeles, I mentioned earlier when we were looking at the demographics in Los Angeles, trying to identify where all of the Asian Americans are, and then trying to draw district lines so that there would be, quote unquote, you know, the Asian American district so we can elect somebody into the assembly. That was a very difficult thing to do because you could draw, you know, some lines around where the Asian Americans lived, but you didn't necessarily came up with a community that was united so that they could elect somebody. I mean, and just in the Filipino community, I can tell you, as a matter of fact, that Daly City is probably 73% ethnic. You know, a majority of the ethnic people in Daly City are Filipinos, and yet they have not been able to elect a Filipino to the city council because there's so many of them trying to run all at the same time, and so none of them win. It happens when you try to draw district lines around ethnic communities. And so I, I think that what we need to do is, is uh, educate our children, educate our young people about what politics is all about, what, is it, what it is useful for, and let everybody gain experience and background and make their decisions as to which party they want to affiliate with. I happen to be a Democrat because I believe in the principles of the Democratic Party and the way uh, that I explain that to my Republican supporters is that they really don't have any issue that I cannot take up myself. So, you know, we just talk with each other, as Tony said, and try to move on. Um, but it's, it's something that will change as more and more Asian Americans become citizens, you know, and more and more become registered voters. I think that will change. I'll give you a short answer. Hawaii is a textbook case where we have a very large, if you add the whole Asian population together, of course, they are the majority. But because of the separation of the various ethnic groups and their tendency to vote uh, according to the issues or according to their party affiliation, which is an emotional one, the Japanese Americans tend to vote Democrat, the Chinese Americans tend to vote uh, Republican, uh, the Korean Americans, the Filipino Americans, uh, and then, of course, you've got the Vietnamese. These people are for grabs. They're the ones that uh, we try to approach because they're not as set in their political ideology. But in order for a person like me to win, I've got to get at least 40 to 50 percent of the Japanese American vote, and that means I have to crack into the Democrat stronghold. So. It does become a, California is going to transcend and move from what they're trying to do in convincing Asian Americans to support them to the point where eventually they're gonna be like Hawaii where your Asian groups do break up. Uh, the tendency, however, in the final analysis, if an Asian American person is being challenged uh, for a very high office by someone other than an Asian American, the tendency there is to pull together. The, uh, I cannot speak uh, for all Asian American. However, I, I think that uh, there's quite a great number of uh, Vietnamese American affiliated with the Republican Party due to the kind of uh, circumstances created after during the war in Vietnam, and that kind of, uh, you know, some sort like emotional, kind emotional of and they tend to put the uh, choice on Republican instead of uh, Democrat. However, the, this is the, a healthy country with a two-party line, and I think that, you know, that is the choice of the people, um, you know, as far as the, uh, we are concerned, we, we think that the, we have to educate, you know, more uh, people, particularly the case of myself. When I first run this time for the city council, I had to compete with, not only with four others, non-Vietnamese, but I also compete with another Vietnamese candidate uh, for the two years seat that I am uh, serving. 
And uh, a lot of Vietnamese think that the, uh, the kind of uh, position that I am uh, holding uh, get a very high pay. And uh, it's a lot of things. As a matter of fact, we are public servant. Uh, I earn uh, $426 a month after deduction of my health insurance, <laughs> I earn about $32 net a month, and I feel so great, highly motivated, and <laughs> I'm very proud to be humble, too. So that's the kind of thing that, you know, it's, uh, I have to, to educate more people to know that this is a different ball game, you know, here in America. We have to do things for the constituent, not for ourselves. That's the kind of you know, education that we feel that we have to share with others. Thank you. Don't go into public service if you want to make money. <laughs> <laughs> That's the lesson. I just wanted to uh, remind folks that we have roughly a little bit over five minutes left in tonight's discussion, and then afterwards we will proceed behind the stage for a, a, a quick reception. Um, the term Asian American is a nice umbrella term that covers us, but I think that people that aren't Asian American view us as you know, one block, whereas in fact we are from very distinct communities, the Chinese, Vietnamese, Japanese, and Philippine communities, et cetera. Do you think that our diversity divides us and prevents us from hiring, or from, um, from voting for one representative that can represent us all? Do you think we can rally together? given the fact that we do come from such diverse communities? Well, if you want political clout, you hang together because your numbers are few. Uh, of course, the philosophy, the ideology, the uh, stances on issues have to be firm, uh, firmly agreeable to, to everyone involved. I do think that the diversity is wonderful for cultural and educational reasons, but I think for political reasons, it works against us. Over here. Hi. Uh, there are obviously barriers to the cultural acceptance of Asian Americans in the United States. Yet, uh, apart from possibly Hawaii and some districts in California, any potential Asian American candidate would have to appeal to all people, not just Asian Americans. That would necessitate then that they, that they sort of integrate themselves with the rest of American society, especially culturally. To what extent do you believe this necessity of integration actually sacrifices some of the aspects of our original heritage? Do you want to do that? You want to do that first? You go ahead. Ask the lady first. <laughs> well, I don't. I don't really believe that um, integrating into the general community out there necessarily means that you give up your culture. I happen to, uh, you know, I happen to be an immigrant, and I happen to still speak the language <coughs> that I came here with, and um, I happen to enjoy all of the cultural traditions of the Filipino um, community. I don't think that you really need to do that. I think you really need to know who you are, what you are, why you're doing what you're doing, and who you're doing it for, and there's no problem. For the case of the uh, Vietnamese uh, American, I think that you know uh, you really uh, gone through a very different uh, aspect of it in a lot of sense uh, politically. Uh, let's take my case at hand. I've been a refugee three times in my life. Uh, in 1946, I was 10 years old. I got lost during the war between the French and resistance force, and I was by myself. And then 1954, the country divided into two halves. I moved south the second time as a refugee. The third time, I was evacuated here. I lost practically everything, and that kind of, you know, uh, hurt so much, rebuild the whole things again. It's not like any other immigrant or maybe a few others in the uh, world nowadays. 
But the, the Vietnamese particular, I thought that we couldn't have a chance in, within our generation to have any elected official. We thought that we have to wait until the next, the second generation. And I think that, you know, this is marvelous. It's only in America we have the opportunity to really uh, do something that we think that it's very, very meaningful and uh, it showed that. So I, I believe very strongly that we know that we've gone through a lot of cultural differences. However, if we can have the loving care for each other, and we, like uh, Miss Psyche mentioned, that if we have someone that's strong enough, provide good leadership, and we talk the same language, we could really support that person, no matter he is or she is from whatever cultural background, particularly in the Asian community. Let's take one more question. Yeah, um, I think we should learn something from the Jewish Americans. Think about this. The Jewish, okay, the, the Jewish Americans are well educated. So are the uh, Asian Americans. The Jewish Americans are voter too. So are Jewish, and so are Asian Americans. The Jewish Americans are also highly intelligent. So are the Asian Americans. Excuse me. Uh, yes, um, but, but the I want to make sure this is a, right. in the form of a question, okay? Right. But, <laughs> but I do not have a question. I just more comment. But, the, but if you look at the uh, Jew, uh, Jewish Americans, first of all, they are unified. We are not. Lesson number one. Lesson number two, the Jewish Americans <coughs> went in the socialization process. They encourage their children, not just to be a businessman or to be a professional, but they encourage them to go to, into politics, to, to be lawyers. Many of us do not do that. We used to go to engineers, science, mathematics, business, laundrymen, something like that, whatsoever. Lesson number two. Now, lesson number three, two, look at Jewish Americans, two. They, when, when they run for office, they do not just say, well, just look at the Jewish, uh, uh, Jewish American population. They look at much broader spectrum of the population. But we have been talking about how should we appeal to the Asian Americans. Yeah, we should, but we should go further too because we're only, as someone said, only 3% of the, of the population. How can you compete <coughs> with someone who might come from a larger percentage of the population in terms of ethnic any uh, response from the panel on that? Yes, I, I'd like to respond to that because you have hit upon the comparison or the analogy that is absolutely perfect. In other words, it, that's exactly what I'm talking about. The Jewish community has done it. Uh, APAC, which is the American Israel Political Action Committee, is one of the most formidable lobby groups in Washington. The Jewish community, however, have different other kinds of Jewish organizations that have to do with culture, education, and they have to do with uh, specific issues that the community may want. But they pull together when there is an issue that they really want to have passed. Numbers count, yes, I grant you, but effectiveness is just as powerful so that you don't have to be 40% of the population in order to be heard. The blacks make up only 12% of the total population, and they are doing marvelously well in integrating into the community. They've got a long way to go, but politically they are becoming very recognizably strong. Asians make up 3% of the population, but we're a very fast-growing area, a fast-growing segment of the community, but you see there has to be this effectiveness, a togetherness, and stances on various issues with which we all agree, and we can be heard. With that as a last word, I would encourage you to uh, stay for the reception. I'm sure that you know, since there's a lot more questions, you can uh, talk informally with the speakers. Um, Mr. Lung, let me have uh, oh, just an answer a little bit about 
that gentleman's uh, concern. I think that I, I agree totally. However, you know, that's why this forum created for that effort. And we depend upon all walks of life within the Asian, communi Asian American community to really forget about where you're from, your cultural differences, and let's stick together and do something with your loving care and don't be as selfish. That, that's my advice. Is. And I, I depend very entirely on the next generation also to do uh, your, you know, we just are the one that try to pave the road to be one of the first one. And we hope that the next generation and you gentlemen and, and lady can follow up and do something else united. We stand. Thank you. I think um, tonight's discussion have only really begun to touch the tip of the iceberg. Uh, you know, I guess some of the chapters in this history have, you know, been started to be written by some of these authors up here, but I think remain for you all to write the rest of the book. So with that, I w uh, want to thank you very much for your attention and thank the panel very much. Thank you.